Thank you. The recession that's constricted uh, our state funds that were already at historic lows as a share of our budget. The recession's constricted our investment income and has made development an even greater challenge for us. And certainly it's affected families trying to send their children to college. Now the Texas economy is doing a lot better now. And certainly it has done better than most of the country. But we still see dramatic effects on our own campus. We still have to be very creative of how we use our resources to move our university ahead. I am so proud of this campus for the way it's responded to these challenges. We have made huge changes with your help. Let's remember that we've already cut $47 million a year out of our budget. It's been painful, but we've done it. But as I've often said, the work of reform is never done. As people in my faith say, we're reformed and always reforming. So we have to always look and continue to look for ways to save money and use our resources more wisely. Now, why do this? One reason, of course, is to keep a UT degree as affordable as possible for our students and for their families. But another reason, a critical reason, is to free up resources to continue on our path to become the best public university in America. This time, it's not just to balance the budget. It's so we can develop the long-term resources to invest in our core missions of teaching and research to move our university forward. The Commission of 125 gave us a broad brush picture of where the university needs to go academically. And that work is ongoing, and we've made a tremendous amount of progress, especially in reforming our undergraduate curriculum and our undergraduate experience and in strengthening our academic departments. But we can't do that work unless we free up resources to continue to support it. In 2007, I convened the President's Policy Advisory Committee, consisting of faculty, students, staff, and administrators, to benchmark UT against other great American research universities. I asked them to focus on key things we need to do to be the very best public university in America. The results were not surprising. We lag behind our competition in faculty salaries and support. We lag behind in graduate student support. We lag behind in undergraduate scholarship. <clears throat> and we lag behind in facilities. And so we began to remedy some of those issues and we made progress on that. But of course, the recession got in the way. We need to find the resources to continue on that path. So where can we look for these resources? One place, of course, is philanthropy. And we're working hard at that with great and generous support from our alumni and our friends. And as the economy turns around, we need to continue to make our case to our legislature and the political leadership about the value of our flagship, the value of UT to our state. And we are working hard at that during this legislative session. But we also must find resources within our own budget. If we won't, we won't fulfill our academic goals. This, by the way, is the money ball philosophy that I've highlighted so often and is the, is the underpinning of our revamped budgeting process. We have to always ask whether we're deploying our resources and those that we have in the most effective way. In my first State of the University address, <clears throat> I proposed the notion that if we could just transfer 1% of our budget every year from low return to high return activities, then compounded year after year, it would make a tremendous difference to our campus. And we've done that through our budgeting process. We need to continue to do that. And now with a special focus on our administrative budgets and our administrative processes. 
we need to continue reforming our business operations, similar to what the Commission of 125 recommended for our academic goals. Universities, real universities, are not simply businesses. So not all business concepts are practical or even appropriate. For example, students aren't simply customers who are always right. In order for students to learn, faculty members must often remind students that they're not always right. Trying to employ business ideals across the entire spectrum of our academic uh, enterprise would be folly. Or put another way, we need to remember the academic nature of our business. So universities aren't simply businesses, but in some ways, they're like businesses, processing applications, supporting information technology, reimbursing travel, buying paper from outside vendors, turning on lights, printing and mailing, and I could go on and on. In these areas, we ought to be following the best business practices. As a recipient of both tax dollars and tuition dollars, to do otherwise would, to be, would be to be betray the public trust. For any public institution, efficiency on these areas is a moral imperative. But it's also the smart thing to do because it can free up much needed resources that we can direct to our core missions of teaching and to research. Now, none of this is new. Business operations and efficiency have long been a part of our university story. President H.Y. Benedict, who was appointed in 1927, established such fundamental business tools and procedures as a handbook and an accounting system. When Benedict passed away 10 years later, his friend Roy Betacek reflected that they, these basic business practices had become an important and routine part of the university, all to our benefit. We thought about these things even back then. In much more, in much more recent history, my predecessor, President Larry Faulkner, undertook a major reorganization of our presidential portfolio. This was extremely effective, and we're still reaping the benefits today of his strategic vision. We've done a good job of adopting better business practices, but we've picked a lot of the low-hanging fruit. Now it's time to get out the ladder and go after some of the fruit higher up in the tree. So to that end, in April of last year, I asked 13 distinguished leaders in business to come together and offer their advice on aspects of the university's business operations and processes that could be improved, could be streamlined, and could be leveraged to better effect. We called it the Committee on Business Productivity. Over the course of, that, of the year, they met several times as a full committee and even more often as working subcommittees. In addition, the committee's support staff, some of whom established an office on this campus, conducted scores of interviews with our own staff and with staff across the country on aspects of campus operations, campus assets, and commercialization of intellectual property. I'm happy to report that they report that our staff has been extremely cooperative, tremendously supportive, and very open to new ideas. And so I brought us together today to release their report, which they call Smarter Systems for a Greater UT. And I want to share with you a few of the committee's ideas and give you a sense of the direction and the scale of change that they are considering and that we are considering. Now, I want to repeat that these recommendations are in the service of our core academic mission of teaching and research. And my longstanding and often repeated goal of making UT the best public university in America. 
This was the ethos adopted by the committee. Their ethos was not just to lower cost of our business practices. It was to make them better and to channel the savings into our teaching and research missions. I believe that this work is critical to our academic aspirations. The ramifications of the committee's report are sweeping. The combined recommendations could yield as much as $490 million over a decade. That's a lot of money, and we could do a lot with it. It's greater, though granted over 10 years, than the total state uh, appropriations and AUF for 2012-13, which is $471 million. And these estimates are conservative. So the savings, albeit again over 10 years, could end up being more than our total tuition for a year, which is $592 million. Now I want to dispel any notion that this will be simple or that it will be easy. Indeed, if we're successful in this endeavor, we'd be the first university in America to overhaul its operational models in all three areas under consideration. But little is worth doing if it's easy. And if it were easy, we'd have done it already. This will be a major effort. It will not happen overnight. It'll require robust and interactive dialogue among faculty, students, and administration. I want to repeat that. It will require the community, the UT community, to have robust dialogue and interactive dialogue among its faculty, students, staff, and administration. It'll require a champion and a structure to manage the change and to facilitate dialogue about that change. It'll require investment in new systems. But if it's to happen at all, all of us, and particularly the deans and vice presidents, need to attack it aggressively and with a sustained focus and energy. As is always the case with projects this large, there will be institutional inertia to overcome. But I believe we must succeed at this, and I believe we will succeed at this effort. Other major multi-year initiatives of my administration, such as transforming the undergraduate curriculum, overhauling the academic budgeting process, and reorganizing our information technology function, all required widespread buy-in. We've succeeded in those projects, and we're going to do it again now with our course transformation project that is ongoing on our campus, and with our push to increase four-year graduation rates. And as I said, now we need to do it with our other business operations. And we're beginning from a position of strength because the committee was extremely impressed by the attitude on our campus and the measures they found already in place. They found that our culture is open to change. <clears throat> now, in addition to understanding what this report is, it's equally important to understand what it is not. I did not seek, and the report does not recommend, any change that would impinge on the faculty and teaching missions of our university. There's no interest in bringing a corporate mentality or strict business values to the classroom. For example, academic departments will always have the responsibility of recruiting faculty and setting curriculum. What the committee asked is whether they should also perform functions like accounting for faculty travel or processing the funding for human resources. Again, all of these recommendations are made in the spirit of enabling the institution to focus its precious resources squarely on the academic and research missions and to lose less of those resources to business practice inefficiencies within our very complex system. In this regard, it's, it's the students and faculty themselves who have the most to gain by, by embracing these transformative recommendations. 
And this report is not a detailed blueprint that designs the details for change. It focuses on areas and recommends that we work diligently and thoughtfully for change through a consultative process on our campus. Now, given the magnitude and complexity of this effort, it's, like, it's likely that not every one of these recommendations will prove to be worth the cost. We'll have to figure out the details as we move forward. But there is no doubt in my mind that these recommendations represent the direction that we need to go. So let me now turn to a broad brush, brush description of the report itself. The committee was divided into three working groups that studied three distinct areas of opportunity. One studied how we can better streamline our administrative processes. The second studied how we can better leverage the assets we have at this university. <clears throat> and the third studied how to go about commercializing our technology. First, our administrative services. The art of governing any federated institution in large part lies in finding the optimal location of authority and responsibility for each function. For example, our institution has matters that are properly left up to the faculty members, the individual faculty members. Other matters are best governed at the department level. Others are best governed and overseen at the college level, and still others are best overseen by the central administration. And some functions, by law or by common sense, are overseen by our system or by the state. <clears throat> For any given function, it's possible to err on either side of the optimal location of responsibility. We don't want departments buying insurance for their faculty and staff. But neither do we want the central administra administration deciding who we want to hire as faculty in a given department. Err on one side, and we become overly centralized. Err on the other, and we become overly federated. The Commission of 125 strongly endorsed the idea that on most academic matters, the main location of responsibility should be in the department. The Committee on Business Practices endorsed this idea. But in matters of business operations, the committee's view is that we're overly federated, overly decentralized, and because of that, we spend more time and money on routine business practices than we should. The Subcommittee on Administrative Services Transformation studied how UT could save money by changing how a number of administrative functions are organized and operated. This shared services initiative would move toward consolidating such functions as finance and procurement, human resources, <clears throat> and information technology. Though some consideration uh, consolidation has already occurred in these areas over recent years, the committee found that the campus is still highly decentralized across the various colleges, schools, and units in comparison to best practices at other universities and in the private sector. Consolidating these administrative functions could yield up to $200 million in savings over the coming decade. To be blunt, to those looking at the university operations from a private sector perspective, this recommendation, among all of them, they felt was a no-brainer. The committee also believes that it will take some initial investment of resources to make these changes, because it will initially require that we update and upgrade some of our platforms and systems to capture these uh, savings in the medium run and in the long run. These savings can only be realized if we make this investment and then actually make the changes in our processes. The second area of the committee's work studied on how we use our assets. 
The Subcommittee on Asset Utilization looked at how we can better leverage our existing assets, such as selling excess power generated by our power plant on the open market, incentivizing deans and department heads to conserve power, bringing UT's food, housing, and parking rates and processes more in line with market values and the private sector, and possibly taking advantage of outsourcing or privatizing some of our functions. These recommendations could yield up to $290 million over a decade. And that amount could dramatically increase if the culture of transformation takes root. The committee also recommends that we invest even more in conserving energy. We've already made a lot of progress in that area. We've cut our per square foot energy use nearly in half in the last 15 years. But we can save even more. The committee believes UT could conserve another 3.5% another of our energy. <clears throat> We should incentivize academic units to save by letting them keep and spend the savings from their own conservation efforts. It's worth noting that this recommendation actually decentralizes control even as it improves efficiency. The subcommittee believes that improvements to buildings, such as updated controls and air handlers, could reduce consumption by another 20%. The cost reduction over a decade could be $59 million. With regard to food, housing, and parking, and other assets we have on the campus, several other universities, including Texas A&M, have generated significant savings and revenue. And the subcommittee recommends that we explore similar avenues. There's no doubt that looking at the possibility of outsourcing certain functions and looking at our rates that we charge for these services, there's no doubt that it's very controversial and it will take a lot of discussion. Housing and food rates, for example, are part of the cost for our students. And parking is part of the benefits package that we offer to our faculty and staff. We need not to forget that. We need to be careful. But we should be making these decisions consciously and have a conscious understanding of what we're doing. And our staff, to be candid, will naturally want to know in plain English, what will all this do for my job? And there's no easy answer to that. For some, the answer may be that their job will remain, but be in a different building or with a different supervisor or in a different structure. For some, it might be off campus. But we need to be discussing these and exploring them. Outsourcing is not a new concept to us. As we did this with janitorial services just last year at the Pickle Research Campus and with minimal impact on the majority of the staff affected. And consider all the ways we've been outsourcing all along. We don't have a fleet of airplanes used by faculty to go to meetings. We use Southwest Airlines. Outsourcing is everywhere we look. It's changes in outsourcing that's controversial. I understand fully the anxiety that these ideas engender. But we simply can't afford to ignore the possibility for saving money that we can put into our academic mission. Whatever changes we make, you all have my solemn pledge that they'll be made thoughtfully, with consultation, and with the least negative impact possible while we are still moving toward our goal. I'm confident that the vast majority of these savings coming from labor, labor costs can be achieved through natural attrition, and we have a good track record on that. Over the past five years alone, some 4,000 people have left the payroll of our university voluntarily. 
That's 20% of UT's core staff workforce. I understand fully that natural attrition and strategic consolidation are not always fungible. The positions don't always match up. But 20% turnover in five years is a lot of natural voluntary change that we have to work with in this process. Lastly, the Subcommittee on Technology commercial, uh, Commercialization examined how UT encourages innovation and protects and monetizes the intellectual property design uh, developed on our campus. While the university is already among the nation's best in this area, the committee felt that UT can raise its game to another level to spur innovation, to foster entrepreneurship, and to generate economic growth in our region and across the state. The committee found that the best performers were those universities who concentrated their efforts on increasing the sheer volume of licenses and who did not focus on trying to prejudge which pieces of intellectual property would prove to be winners or losers in the marketplace. The committee firmly concluded that concentrating on volume is the best direction to go. The committee's key recommendations for making this shift began with the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. Harm in this case would result from centralized control over aspects of commercialization in a way that would actually stifle innovation among our faculty and students. But there are things we can do better at the center. The committee felt that the university should establish a structure to exchange ideas and best practices among many entities currently involved in technology commercialization. And they could also resolve conflicts and other obstacles to moving forward in licensing. As I said, for many recommendations, further study is needed to determine whether and how to implement that change. So today is not the time to announce in detail which recommendations we'll use and what form they'll take to be implemented. But I can announce that I'm adopting the committee's first recommendation, a recommendation that sets in motion all subsequent action flowing from this project. This is to appoint a champion to oversee these changes. Having a champion Someone who wakes up each morning and whose job it is to drive change forward is critical. This practice has been key to virtually all of the substantial changes occurring during my administration. When we wanted to make real change in undergraduate education, I appointed Paul Woodruff to be the champion, eventually becoming the inaugural dean of undergraduate studies. When I wanted to make real improvement in our four-year graduation rates. I appointed David Laudy to the new position of senior vice president, senior vice provost for enrollment and graduation management. As a part of that effort, when it became time to overhaul orientation, I appointed Associate Dean Mark Music to be our orientation chapter. And so today, I'm asking Kevin Hegarty, vice president and chief financial officer, to take on this task. It'll be his job to wake up every morning and make real progress toward the goals that we end up approving. He reports directly to me and has sufficient power to resolve conflict and overcome institutional inertia. He'll establish a consultive governance structure and process, just as he did in information technology to involve faculty and staff and students to move forward. Kevin, I want to thank you for undertaking this effort. This work will be hard. But I said in the beginning, it's crucial that we direct more of our resources into our teaching and research. And we need to do that to foster a civil society, to bolster our understanding of the universe, to bolster our understanding of the human place in that universe, 
and to collaborate with fellow institutions across the world, building humanity's body of knowledge, and then teaching it to our students, and teaching them how to go about how they will create more of it in the future. What specifically we do with that money? Uh, what then specifically will we do with that money that we save and the revenue that we bring in? Of course, in detail, this is a question that has to be answered in each budget year. But in general, I can tell you that it will help fund long-term initiatives aimed at improving our core mission of teaching and research. Will it look exactly like this two years from now? Surely not. But even if we can capture half of these savings, it'll be worth doing. And I think we can capture much more than that. Yes, there'll be pain and stress in getting it done. But it'll be worth it if we're going to be the best public university in America. In 1586, the then Pope decided that an obelisk at the Circus Maximus should be moved to the square in front of the new St. Peter's Basilica. The good news in that effort was that the move was only 256 meters. The bad news was that, was that the obelisk weighed 344 tons. There are lessons for us in how they undertook that literally monumental task. First, they didn't try and do it in a single day. In fact, it took more than a year. Some parts of the task before us, we can start immediately. But this will be an iterative process, and we should expect the organizational landscape to look different in five years. It will take time. So this pope took his time to get it right. He took it one logical step at a time. He had to invest in equipment to get the job done. And everyone worked together, pulling in the same direction, and working with a single-minded unity of purpose. We will have to do all of those same things. And one more thing. Because they were successful at that, Many more obelisks were moved around Rome in the following years. If we get this right, there's no telling what else we'll be able to accomplish. And there will be other areas of our business operations that will need our attention to. So today, I present the committee's report to our campus. And I'm extremely grateful to these 13 leaders for their expertise, their dedication of time, their insight, and their hard work. I believe that decades from now, we'll look back on this moment as a turning point in our ability to serve our constituents better and to focus more of our resources and our energy on our core function. Steve Rollator chaired the Committee on Business Productivity. Steve James chaired the committee, the subcommittee, on administrative services uh, transformation. Gary Cusin chaired the subcommittee on asset utilization. And Charles Tate, who's with us here today, chaired the subcommittee on technology commercialization. The other committee members were Jason Downey, Paul Kinsher, David Moras, Benjamin Rodriguez, Hector Ruiz, Sam Susser, Larry Tu, Lynn Utter, and Marcy Zlotnick. This was a very hardworking committee. And each and every member, as well as the support staff and everyone on this campus who worked with this committee, and the support staff from the Global Management Consultant, Accenture, each of them and each of you have my profound thanks for your work. And so now, the real work begins. 
As I said, this process will be iterative. Rome was not built in a day, and neither was the operational structure of America's fifth largest university. We're going to be systematic, and we're going to get it right. But we need to start and work hard on this process. I want to thank all of you and everyone on our campus for all of your help in this effort. Thank you very much, and welcome.